Hello and welcome to my channel, Blue Snakes and More. Today we're going to be talking about John Wayne Gacy, so please like this video and subscribe to the channel. And for more videos like this, also watch my other house channel, a and Snakes and Stuff. My youngest son's channel, Henny's Toys and Games. Or my oldest son's channel, Little Chris 10. Now let's dive into the video. John Wayne Gacy, March 17th, 1942 through May 10th, 1994 was an American serial killer and sex offender who raped, tortured, and murdered at least 33 young men and boys in Norwood Park Township near Chicago, Illinois. He became known as the Killer Clown due to his public performances as a clown prior to the discovery of his crimes. Born March 17, 1942, Chicago, Illinois, USA. Died May 10, 1994. Aged 52, Statesville Correctional Center, Illinois, USA. Other names, The Killer Crown. Criminal status, executed by lethal injection. Spouses, Marilyn Myers. 60, married in 64, divorced in 69. Carol Huff, married in 72, divorced in 76. Children, two. Convictions, Iowa, sodomy. Illinois, murder, 33 counts. Indecent liberties with children. Divert sexual assault. Details, victims, 33 plus. Span of crimes, 1972. Through 1978, country, United States, state, Illinois, and Iowa. Date apprehended December 21st, 1978. Imprisoned at Maranard Correctional Center. Gracie committed all his known murders inside his ranch tire house. Typically, he would lure a victim to his home and drape them, dope them into dying handcuffs on the pretext of demonstrating a magic trick. He would then rape and torture his captive before killing his victim by either asphyxiation or strangulation with a garrette. 26 victims were buried in the cross space of his home and three were buried elsewhere on his property. Four were discarded in the Deep Plains River Gracie had previously been convicted in 1968 of the sodomy of a teenage boy in Waterloo, Iowa, and was sentenced to 10 years imprisonment. He served 18 months. He murdered his first victim in 1972, had murdered twice more by the end of 1975, and murdered at least 36 victims after his divorce from his second wife in 1976. The investigation into the disappearance of the Plains teenager Robert Priest led to Gracie's arrest on December 21st, 1978. His conviction of 33 murders by one individual then covered the most homicides, most homicides in the United States legal history. Gracie was sentenced to death on March 13, 1980. He was executed by lethal injection at Statesville Correctional Center on May 10th, 1994. Early life, childhood, John Wayne Gacy was born at Edgewood Hospital in Chicago, Illinois, on March, third, set, on March 17, 1942, the second of three children and only son of John Stanley Gracie and Marilyn Elaine Robinson. His father was an auto repair machinist and World War I veteran, and his mother was a homemaker. Gracie was of Polish and Danish ancestry, and his family was Catholic. Gracie was close to his mother and two sisters, but had a difficult relationship with his alcoholic father, who was verbally and physically abusive to his family. The elder Gracie frequently belittled his son, calling him dumb and stupid, and comparing him unfavorably with his sisters. One of Gracie's earliest childhood memories was of his father beating him at age four for accidentally disarranging car engine components. His mother tried to shield her son from his father's abuse 
which resulted in accusations, in accusations that he was a sissy and a mama's boy. Who would probably grow up queer? Queer. In 1949, Gracie's father whipped him after he and another boy were caught sexually fondling a young girl. The same year, a family friend began to occasionally molest Gracie. Gracie never told his father, afraid that his father would blame him. Despite their challenging relationship, Gracie loved his father, but felt he was never good enough in his father's eyes. Gracie was an overweight and unathletic child. Because of a heart condition, he was told to avoid sports. In the fourth grade, Gracie began to experience blackouts. He was hospitalized on occasion because of these episodes. And also in 1957, for a burst appendix. Gracie later estimated that between the ages of 14 and 18, he had spent almost a year in hospital. He attributed the decline of his grades to missing school. Gracie's medical condition was never conclusively diagnosed. His father suspected he was malingering. On one occasion, he openly accused his son of faking as he lay in a hospital bed. Career Origins In 1960, at age 18, Gracie became involved in politics. Working as an assistant precinct captain, for a local Democratic Party candidate. This led to more criticism from his father, who called him a patsy. The same year Gracie's father bought him a car. He kept the vehicle tighter in his own name until Gracie had paid for it, which took several years. His father would confiscate the keys if Gracie did not do as he said. In April 1962, Gracie purchased an extra set of keys in response, his father removed the distributor cap, keeping the component for three days. Hours after his father replaced the cap, Gracie left home and drove to Las Vegas, Nevada, with $136 to his name in the hope of residing with a cousin. Gracie worked in the Las, An Las Vegas Ambulance Service before being transferred to Palm Mortuary. He worked as a mortuary attendant for three months, absorbing, observing morticians and bobbing bodies, and occasionally serving as a pallbearer. He slept on a cot behind the embalming room and later confessed that one evening while alone, he climbed into the coffin of a teenage male, embracing and caressing the body before experiencing a sense of shock. The experience promoted Gracie to return home. Shortly thereafter, Gracie enrolled at Northwestern Business College, despite having failed to complete high school. He graduated in 1963 and took a management training position with the Nunn Bush Shoe Company. In 1964, the company transferred into Springfield, Illinois, to work as a salesman and eventually promoted him to department manager. In March of that year, he became engaged to Marilyn Myers, a co-worker. During their courtship, Gracie joined the local chapter of the JCs. That same year, he had his second homosexual experience. According to Gracie, a colleague in the JCs piled him with drinks and invited him to spend the evening on his sofa the colleague then performed oral sex on him while he was drunk. In 1965, Gracie had risen to the position of vice president of the Springfield JCs and was named the third most outstanding JC in Illinois. Waterloo, Iowa, KFC manager Gracie and Myers married in September 1964. Maryland's Father substantially purchased three Kentucky Fried Chicken restaurants in Waterloo, Iowa. The company moved there so Gracie could manage the restaurants with the understanding that they would move into Maryland's parents' former home. The offer was luxurate. Luxurate. 
Gracie would receive 15000 per year, the equivalent of about 153000 as of 2024, plus a share of the restaurant's profits. Gracie opened a club in his basement where his employees could drink alcohol and play pool. Although Gracie employed teenagers of both sexes, he socialized only with the males. Gacy gave many of them alcohol before he made sexual advances. If they rebuffed him, he would claim his advances were jokes or a test of morals. His wife gave birth to a son in February 1966 and a daughter in March 1967. Gracie later described this period of his life as perfect. He had finally earned his father's approval. When Gracie's parents visited in July 1966, his father privately apologized for the abu abuse he had inflicted before happily saying, Son, I was wrong about you, as he shook Gracie's hand. Waterloo J.C.'s in Waterloo, Gracie joined the local JC's chapter, regularly offering extended hours to the organization, in addition to the 12 to 14 hour days. He worked managing the restaurants at meetings. Gracie often provided fried chicken and insisted on being called Colonel. He and other Waterloo JC's were also deeply involved in drug abuse, pornography, post prostitution, and wife swapping. Although Gracie, Gacy was considered ambitious and a bogget, bigot, the J.C.'s held him in high regard for his fundraising work. In 1967, he was named Outstanding Vice President of Waterloo J.C.'s and served on the Board of Directors. Assault of Donald Voorhees in August 1967, Gracie sexually, sexually assaulted 15-year-old Donald Voorhees Jr., the son of Ed Donard Edwin Voorhees, a local politician and former J.C., Gracie lured Voorhees to his house with the promise of showing him homosexual stag films regularly played at J.C.'s events. Heterosexual stag films regularly played at J.C.'s events. Gracie plowed Voorhees with alcohol, allowed him to watch a stag movie, then persuaded him to engage in mature, mature oral sex, adding, you have to have sex with a man before you start having sex with women. Over the following months, Gracie abused several other youths, including one whom he engaged, encouraged to have sex with his own wife before blackmailing him into performing oral sex on him. Gacy also tricked several teenagers into believing he was commissioned to conduct homosexual experiments for scientific research and pay them up to $50 each. In March 1968, Voorhees told his father that Gracie had sexually assaulted him. Voorhees Sr. immediately informed the police, who arrested Gracie and charged him with performing oral sodomy on Voorhees and the attempted assault of a 16-year-old Edward Lynch. Gracie violently denied the charges and demanded him to take a polygraph test. The results of these tests were indecisive, were indecisive of deception. Gracie publicly denied any wrongdoing and insisted the charges were politically motivated. Voorhees Sr. had opposed Gracie's nomination for appointment as president of the Iowa J.C. Several fellow J.C.'s found Gracie's story credible and rallied to his support. However, on May 10, 1968, Gracie was excited on the sodomy charge. The most striking aspect of the test results is the patient's total denial of responsibility for anything that has happened to him. He can produce an alibi for anything. He presents himself as a victim of circumstances and blames other people who are out to get him. The patient attempts to assure a sympathetic response by dictating himself as being at the mercy of a hostile environment. Because it's got a hole in it! Section of report detailing Gracie's 1968 psychiatric evaluation. 
On August 30th, Gracie promised one of his employees, 18-year-old Russell Schroeder, $300 if he physically assaulted Voorhees. In an effort to discourage the boy from testifying in court, Schroeder lured Voorhees to an isolated park, sprayed mace in his eyes, then beat him. Voorhees escaped and reported Schroeder's actions to police. Schroeder was arrested the next day, initially denying involvement. He soon confessed to an assaulting Voorhees. Indicating he had done so at Gracie's request, police arrested Gracie and charged him with hiring Schroeder to assault and intimidate Voorhees. On September 12, Gracie was ordered to undergo a psychiatric evaluation at the psychiatric hospital in, of the University of Iowa. Two doctors concluded he had an antisocial personality disorder. The clinical team termed for sociopathy and or psychopathy, was unlikely to benefit from treatment and that his behavior pattern was likely to bring him into repeated conflict with society. The doctors concluded Gracie was mentally contempt to stand trial. Conviction and imprisonment. On November 7th, 1968, Gracie pleaded guilty to one count of sodomy in relation to Voorhees but not guilty to the charges related to other use. He claimed Voorhees had offered himself to him and that he had acted out of curiosity. His story was not believed. Gracie was convicted of sodomy on December 3rd and sentenced to 10 years imprisonment to be served at the Alamo Rosa State Penitentiary. That same day, Gracie's wife petitioned for divorce, requesting she be awarded the couple's home and property so custody of their two children in alimony. The court ruled in her favor, and the divorce was finalized on September 18, 1969. Gracie never saw his first wife or children again. During his incarceration, Gracie rapidly acquired a reputation as a model prisoner. Within months of his arrival, he had risen to the position of head cook. He also joined the inmate JC chapter, and increased its membership from 50 to 650 men in less than 18 months. Gracie secured an increase in the inmates' daily pay in the prison mess hall and supervised several projects to improve conditions for inmates, including the installation of a miniature golf course. He was presented with a Distinguished Service Award for his efforts within the inmate JC's chapter in February 1970. In June 1969, Gracie was denied parole to prepare for his second scheduled parole hearing in May 1970. He completed 16 high school courses, obtaining his diploma in November 1969. On Christmas Day 1969, Gracie's father died from cirrhosis. When informed of his father's death, Gracie's collapsed to the floor sobbing. His request for supervised Compassionate leave to attend a funeral was denied. When we turned to Chicago, Gracie was granted parole with 12 months probation on June 18, 1970, having served 18 months of his 10-year sentence. Conditions of his probation included a nightly curfew and that Gracie relocate to Chicago to live with his mother. On his release, Gracie told friend and fellow J.C. Clarence Lane, who picked him up from the prison, and had remained steadfast in his belief of Gracie's innocence, that he would never go back to jail, and that he tended, intended to reestablish himself in Waterloo. However, within 24 hours, Gracie had relocated to Chicago. He arrived there by bus on June 19th and shortly thereafter obtained a job as a short-order cook. On February 12, 1971, Gracie was charged with sexually assaulting a teenage boy who claimed that he had lured him into his car at Chicago's Greyhound bus terminal and driven him to his home, where he had attempted to force the boy into sex. The court dismissed this complaint when the boy failed to appear. On June 22nd, Gracie was arrested and charged with aggravated sexual battery and reckless conduct 
in response to a complaint filed by a youth who claimed that Gracie had flashed a sheriff's badge, lured him into his car, and forced him to perform oral sex. These charges were dropped after the complainant attempted to blackmail Gracie. The Iowa Board of Parole did not learn of these incidents. Gracie's parole ended on October 18, 1971, and a month later, the record of Gracie's criminal convictions in Iowa were, set, were sealed. 8213 West Somerdale Lane. With financial assistance from his mother, Gracie bought a ranch tire house at 8213 West Somerdale Avenue in unincorporated Norwood Park Township, Illinois, part of Metropolitan Chicago. He lived there until his arrest in December 1978, and according to Gracie, committed all of his murders there. Gracie was active in his local community and helpful towards his neighbors. He willingly loaned his construction tools and plowed snow from neighborhood walks free of charge. From 1974 to 1978, he hosted themed inner summer parties. These events were atten attended by up to 400 people, including politicians and business associates.